uh, like I say, you can start it and then we'll, um, we'll wait till we get about five people anyway. Well, we can wait to five minutes. It's, it's just five o'clock now. Yeah, the other beauty that I have found uh, is I haven't been able, I you know, taught a class earlier, so wasn't able to attend, but everything goes live on that site pretty quickly. And so was able to click and watch a couple of the things that I didn't have time to attend live, but they're doing a great job with the hub of putting all the recordings there. Yeah, because I think with, since you have to choose, it's, it's nice to know, well, I'll watch this one live and then I'm going into this one later. This is where we give a shout out to Dr. Clark and uh, AJ and his team for all the hard work they've done. They did a great job putting this together. Well, AJ certainly, actually, Marco Clark, he, it seemed to me like I got word from him about every three days. And I kept thinking that I hadn't done what I was supposed to do because, and he said, no, these are just general messages we're sending to everybody. And I thought they were saying I hadn't done this or I hadn't done that. And, but between Laura and AJ and Marco Clark, I don't think they're, they missed a thing. They'll sleep well after this weekend, I hope. <laughs> right. Where were you born? So I was born in Texas and was there for just a few years. And then I grew up mostly in Florida and was there until I went to St. Mary's and spent my four years there and then have settled here in Kensington, well, in Silver Spring, but settled my life here <laughs> surrounding Kensington. Are you married? Do you have children? Yeah, my husband is a Notre Dame uh, grad and we have four kids. I have a 12 year old, a seven year old, a five year old. Those are my three girls and then a two and a half year old boy. Wow. Yeah, so hopeful future ladies of the academy here at uh, the Kensington campus for the next couple of years. Well, that's a big difference between 12 year old and two year old mm -hmm. because they run in two different directions. Yes, they do. And four of them run in four different directions. I am not often bored, sister. And do you work full time? I do. Do you have somebody to help you? <laughs> uh, in the office? <laughs> no, at home. Uh, um, no. We have, uh, my youngest is in daycare and then the three girls are at one of our parochial schools in the area. Do you have dogs? No. <laughs> Some people complicate things by putting animals in the, in the stew. I finally came around and the two oldest have fish now, one fish a piece. Um, but that was, I said we could get a dog if I could stay home from work, but I A, love my job and B, uh, we're, we're doing the Catholic education route. So it's <laughs> necessary that I work at this point. <laughs> well, the 12 year old could take care of the dog. <laughs> but she Not would train it, <laughs> but he could take care of one if, it can, if you, Got one that was already trained out of a shelter. Maybe uh, someday, but not not right now. <laughs> after the two-year-old gets out of diapers. We'll see. Yeah, that's when I have plans of traveling the world. So <laughs> <laughs> maybe coming to Brazil. Uh, you well, if you if you're serious about it, I can just write me and we can you can stay with us. We have a guest room. Wonderful. I would love that. So one time we had somebody come from Notre Dame, husband, wife, and four kids. Well, now and, the you can house us. <laughs> well, actually we had two rooms, the mom and dad, and I think the littlest kid were in the double bed, in the, in the big bed. And then the other kids slept in, I think like something like sleeping bags in the other room. Sure. But they did just fine. <laughs> They were used to traveling and so, um, you know, if the parents had them really organized in terms of what to do and dirty clothes and straightening up and fixing the bed. It, it really, um, with organization, you can have 40 kids, but without <laughs> organization, you can't even have one. <laughs> That's true. So. Well, sister, well, we're at 405. So since this is being recorded, why don't you go ahead and start? And that way, whether people join or not, at least we'll have the recording of your presentation. Okay. Well, my name is Sister Diane, Diane Cundiff. I've been missioned in Brazil since 1975. And presently, I'm coordinator of the Sisters of Holy Cross in South America, also president of the legal entity of Holy Cross in Brazil. And for more than 40 years, I'm principal of College Santa Maria. 
So why did I agree to do this presentation? Even though our congregation wants to be present for the celebration of the 200 years since the foundation of the brothers, ex experimenting the daily suffering of COVID worldwide and here in Brazil with over 4,000 deaths a day and only 4% of the population vaccinated, we need to share our hope today that is in Le Mans, we also need to join hearts and heads to unite our efforts to defeat ignorance, violence, social justice, injustice, in, and also weakened presence of religious. I'm talking about priests, brothers, um, everybody who's off the street because of COVID. We need to be intentional agents of hope. And we really want to be able to invite everybody with whom we work and minister to be people of the resurrected Jesus who continue to see the kingdom of God in this world of violence, wars, starvation, and, and inhumanity. I participated in, uh, uh, in the various talks today, and there was so much of what I'm going to say that was said by Ann and also by um, the brother who gave the uh, opening address that I know. Um, but a lot of the themes come through over and over again. In my introduction, I said I was going to say what happened in Brazil 74, 74 years ago, which is uh, when the sisters came to Brazil. The Sisters of the Holy Cross accepted an invitation to minister in Sao Paulo, it was a sit-down lunch with uh, the Cardinal of New York, who was a Notre Dame, he, he was from Notre Dame, the priest of Notre Dame, and the sisters were there. He invited the Cardinal from Sao Paulo to come to lunch, and the Cardinal said, oh, gee, why don't you send some sisters down to work in Brazil? And different than whatever happens nowadays, within four months, they are within six months, they had opened a school and um, or get, found a place to stay and found a whole series of things that made it possible for them to, um, to support themselves. They opened a finishing school that they called the Scala Santa Maria, so they could support themselves. That finishing school actually only lasted two years and they opened a kindergarten and every year uh, for the next 13 years, they opened another classroom. And then once they got all of the grades from preschool through uh, the end of secondary level, then the, the space started growing, the building started growing, um, everything about it increased the number of students from 13, all of a sudden it's almost 3,500. And if you came for a visit to Sao Paulo as you promised to come, it's most likely you'll visit the school. But to save time, I'm gonna show you a video that we made just before COVID came out so that you can uh, see what the school's about now. And since COVID came for a visit and overstayed its welcome, this is about what we can do. Although if you do come to visit, I'll show you in person the school. So, let me just turn on the video. In this video, you will get to know Colegio Santa Maria through the voices of those who have experienced not only our history and organization, but something more important than this, our essence. Because this is a unique kind of school. It is a place where every teacher, employee and student assumes a mission to make St. Mary's a place which forms students holistically and develops better human beings.
active people who find their place in society, who can generate transformations of this society to prepare it for better times than ours, which works through an education of quality and of excellence. It is always changing. It's a search for the best project for this school so that it can offer the best. I'm very proud that I've been at St. Mary's for a long time because of its preoccupation with its principles that it works on continuous formation of its teachers. We received qualified teachers, but it's required that we rethink our pedagogical practices that we rethink our practices to transform the daily schoolwork and make possible the most efficient learning for the students. This is done in many ways through meetings, exchange of experiences, and constant processes of reflection. The students study in an environment which stimulates the development of abilities and the construction of their academic knowledge in a broad and rich way through participation in classes and varied activities which open the minds of students to the world of knowledge. We work a lot today with the abilities and competencies which are the tools that we take to life. A student has to develop these to apply them in life, in their profession and personal life. The college has been following its mission for 70 years since it was founded by a group of sisters of the Congregation of the Sisters of the Holy Cross. The world has changed a lot during these years and the college evolved with it without ever losing sight of the pedagogical principles left by Father Moreau, the founder of the congregation. We always put instruction and education side by side. The mind should not be cultivated to the detriment of the heart. Excellence in academic formation has been basic from the beginning of the school and is accompanied by a constant preoccupation with the development of values. It's necessary to constantly make of education an experience of becoming more human, not just of information and content. The mark that the teacher leaves in a student never changes. You teach without speaking, only by modeling. Those of us who work with small children do this a lot. Every teacher has as goal to educate, to know, to live, and to be. For that reason, they go beyond theoretical classes and practices so that students are stimulated to experiment and have experiences that prepare them for being active agents now and in their adult life. In this way, from their youth, they relate directly with themes and information that are indispensable for intellectual development. St. Mary's prepares us very well for our future through group work and projects. We discuss class problems, problems with homework, tests, and anything we think is necessary to improve the dynamic of the class. The student will not only be an agent when he or she becomes an adult. Nowadays, a student of 7, 9, or 12 years old also has projects. Students have all the support they need to choose their academic and professional aims. It was very important for Antonio that excellent teachers talk together about their different curricular areas with a lot of passion, requiring the maximum that he could give. I think that the contribution that the school has in this area is very important and we talk a lot with the teachers and everyone is open to clear up doubts and questioning that the others bring up. Students are also stimulated to participate in social projects to help them widen their vision of the world. So in some way they have a sensitivity to the needs of others. They have a sense of justice and a critical sense. In this way they can stimulate human values 
permanent values such as not to kill, not rob, to love one another. These are Christian ideas, but they're also universal values. Besides developing solidarity, these actions are important experiences to stimulate the student to understand and act in the reality in which he lives, a living that strengthens his personal development. What St. Mary's gave me was contact with people who are very different and had experiences that were very different, but you change as a person. The more experience you have, you become a more complete person. It makes me open my mind so that I see not only my small world, a world that revolves around my umbilical cord, but that there are other people and there are people who live in conditions very different from ours. To speak of St. Mary's in these 70 years is to recuperate a history of dreams, of challenges, and principally a realization on the part of students who could never imagine that one day they would be studying here. We have today 600 adult students registered in night school, and of the 600, many never went to school. It is as if the school was a train that invites everyone to get on, going towards the future, and this trip becomes more and more a bearer of hope. I think that every student at St. Mary's has a little of this thing, a little hope for a better Brazil, for a better world. I want to help people so that they can have a better future. On board of this train, everyone develops character, technical abilities and intellectual abilities. And the capacity to develop solutions, essential characteristics to face life. They need to face this future with seriousness, firmness with security, and also with clarity. that they can make a difference in this world. It is most important that the family of the students also participate in this trip and change along with their children. I began to involve myself with life not just of the school but of the neighborhood and then I followed on and became a participant in all the neighborhood associations in the Security Council, in the Commercial Council opening hearts and minds and investing in an educational quality, St. Mary's School became an institution that opened for each student a way to discover their potential to follow new steps for academic and personal growth. I'm very satisfied with the content that it brings in terms of information, academic formation. And at this time, I'm particularly satisfied with my son, who just entered the university and he graduated this past year. I think that I found myself as a professional because I began doing volunteer work here at St. Mary's. I think it's very important and this marked me a lot. Whoever passes through here is transformed creates bonds that don't break, and with the passing of time, we live a spirit of equality and fraternity that is present in every place of the school. In my time, we used to make trails in the woods, sit on the friendship trunk, and at that time, a big group of us relate to the trunk, as if it were something from another world. It was gigantic. My daughter, who's finishing the university, sometimes has her friends to our house. Each one is in a different university, but it's really cool that these bonds are for their whole lives. The sisters talk to everyone from the cleaning ladies on everybody is equal here. Everyone is different. I think this is really cool. So, did you pay attention to everything we showed you and told you? Because everything you saw explains why the 70 years of history, generations and generations, continue to go through here. 
St. Mary's School has acted throughout its history, making students and families and investing in an education which transforms lives is our true essence of forming bearers of hope. St. Mary's Schools has acted throughout its history making students and families and investing in an education which transforms lives. It is our true essence of forming bearers of hope. Santa Maria and its pastoral pedagogical and formative development has taken 74 years. What began as classrooms over the garage is now 14 plus buildings, four adjoining properties that include two forests, 550 employees, and nearly 3,000 students from preschool to secondary level for children and adults. But that's not the subject of this presentation. I want to tell you about the kind of sisters of the Sisters of the Holy Cross who began their ministries in Brazil in Santa Maria, contributed in diverse areas, and then moved beyond these borders to extend the call of Holy Cross to other great needs in Latin America. It will become evident that the charism of Moreau was planted and developed in an institution of formal education faithful to our vision because of the 44 sisters over the years of which I selected only six because our time is limited. Each of these women has her unique history and talent, but I identified seven characteristics which led them beyond ministry in Santa Maria while leaving the roots and fruits within this original and future ministry. Their lives continue to serve as models for our lay associates with whom we collaborate. I want to start with this first photo of the sisters in our area of Latin America, taken with some priests and brothers of Holy Cross at the end of a joint retreat, because I never forget that our work is the work of a community of sinful saints and of saintly sinners. And that's what is holy and cross for us. So the first person I want to talk about is Sister Olivet Wayland. She was born in Missouri. She was one of the first four original sisters who arrived in 47. She was a nurse and she just spent three and a half years in a Japanese internment camp in the Philippines on her way to serve in Bengal. This is during the time of Second World War for those of you who are very young. Then she was chosen to go to Brazil because um, she wasn't gonna keep on going. She had to recover her health. Once the sisters arrived, they didn't have an address to go to. They didn't speak Portuguese. They didn't have a license to establish a school. They didn't even have contacts except the name of the archbishop who invited them. Like Father Moreau, these four sisters used their talents of making friends and friends of friends who who with faith and persistence overcame every obstacle, especially loneliness. Father Corbet, a Canadian Holy Cross priest who had come to Sao Paulo three years earlier was their good shepherd. After 10 years, Olivet reluctantly left Brazil 
to assume the coordination of the missions outside the United States and was later elected to be Superior General of our congregation. The experience of shared suffering and radical poverty in the camp prepared her to use anything, even maggot soup, to preserve life. Her colleague took out all the maggots, and so her colleague came back sicker than Olivet. Olivet got the protein that she needed. While she had a great love for the poor, she became sister and companion to everyone, regardless of class, background, or study, or culture. She had no problem opening the school year without desks or classroom doors. Sister Catherine DiRici Bartels came from the East Coast of the United States to Brazil to supervise the primary level of Saint Santa Maria. When the sisters were called to a mission beyond the state of Sao Paulo, she founded and formed the parish school in Paraná with the Redemptorist priests. From out of the blue then, she got a phone call from the United States to open the mission in Uganda, a school for re women religious. A few years later, she returned to Brazil and went back to Paraná. She was always concerned with training teachers in methods and how to relate to students and how to be welcoming to students and help them with their education. And the school became a model for other schools in the area. Then she began a search for hearing impaired children. At that time, they were kept hidden at home from embarrassment of the family or belief that these children could not learn. Catherine established special classes for the deaf and changed social culture in the town and in outlying areas, and definitely for these children and families. She also raised funds and established a chapter of the Association of Parents and Friends of Mentally Challenged Children and Young Adults, which is still an example of alternative education in the region. After 50 years in Brazil, Catherine tearfully returned to the United States for health care, her own health care. She changed the lives of children and families who had been excluded in society, much as the lepers were in the time of Jesus. They were able to assume membership within society, first as children and later as adults. Her heart was as big as her skills as an educator, and she never doubted that everyone, especially the most vulnerable, had a right to a quality education that considered their talents rather than their limitations. Another sister, Josephine Mary Delaney, came to Brazil from Hollywood and was a successful teacher and finance manager at Santa Maria. But when the sisters decided to establish a new mission in an extremely poor urban area in another state, she and two companions with no experience to prepare them to serve the greatest needs. The sisters spent their first year praying, visiting the homes in town and on the outskirts, putting themselves at the service of those who received them, whether it was cleaning the house or organizing prayer or youth groups. When Josephine was 60 years old, she answered a new call. The sisters in Peru asked Brazil to send them personnel. Josephine offered because as she said, if I don't go now, I'll be too old to change and learn another language. She's been there 25 years now. She formed support groups for people needing healing from traumas, especially after a devastating fire in downtown Lima. She also helped develop hope and strength after many families lost members and all they had after an earthquake. She scheduled encounters for those seeking reconciliation between members of terrorist groups and poor local families. 
She has unlimited faith and courage to do what needs to be done, even though it involves a task completely beyond her training. Once she delivered a baby when a cab driver stopped in front of her house and called her out. She was as at home in the streets of Sao Paulo or Lima among the poor as she has been among the movie stars who were family friends. Sister Angela Mary Carey, as, Irish, as an Irish ballerina from Chicago, she arrived at Colegio Santa Maria, first as teacher and then as the elementary level principal. But then it was decided that a third sister was needed in a nearby neighborhood of workmen and poor families. Angela was told she should form youth groups. Since she wasn't sure what that was, she would walk down the alleys in the slums and ask kids if they wanted to join a youth group in the Catholic parish. No one came, so she started to invite them for free ballet classes. In the beginning, of course, there were just the um, girls, although eventually she was able to convince some boys to come too. Then she met a young man who was a leader of youth groups and invited him to work with her. She told him he couldn't, she couldn't pay him, but he accepted and they founded a cultural center for youth with art, sports, dance over 40 years ago. Starting in a shack in a slum, today they have three buildings, employees, a contract with the city government. After 40 years with no visible means of support, Angela got help from St. Teresa of Lisieux and former students of Santa Maria and friends from all over to give them donations, usually at the last minute to pay their bills. She always, she'd get to a day and she'd say, I don't want, know what I'm gonna do. I'm asking people not to take salaries tomorrow. And then a donation would be credit. And she always thanked St. Teresa of Lisieux. They work in a slum area where they have organized groups to build a hundred homes in the community, which is presided over by drug gangs. They are respected for their work in the community. So children in Project Sun are not recruited for the drug trade their youth organized public protests against organized crime, corruption and violence, taking buses to government offices, laying down in the streets with red painted t-shirts with the slogan, take an attitude against violence or take an attitude for peace. In the beginning, many priests didn't understand how a sister could do only social ministry. For the poor, she was a model of how Jesus and Mary walked among them. She cried with them and called them to celebrate their lives and reminded them of the fact that she was sent because God loved them and wanted them to know that. Angela has had uncountable opportunities to be afraid from death threats or despair from working in what is an urban war zone. But she is above all a dancer, an, op an optimist, a risk taker because she's Irish and a happy survivor. As a daughter of her own, the educator, she found scholarships in the universities for 40 of her youth. And some of these youth now even are working in this center uh, because they saw the need to stay in the same slum and work for the change of this same slum. <clears throat> the next person I want to talk about is Sister Michael Mary Nolan. She came to Brazil from Washington, DC. She organized the Santa Maria Library and went to work in a different worker parish where the priests of Holy Cross were the pastors. Michael walked daily through the largest slum in Sao Paulo, visiting poor women and their families. 
when a military dictatorship was established in 1964. She was an outspoken supporter of human rights and began a lifelong experience of death threats along with the groups she ministered with. She was constantly frustrated, and she'd say this at home every time she got home, that whenever there was a violation against human and political rights, she wasted time looking for a lawyer to defend the poor. The easiest solution she could think of was for her to become a lawyer, which she did over 30 years ago. Since then, she has defended accused indigenous people and because of her knowledge of their cultures and legal rights related to these guarantees, she has defended those accused of violence when they were defending their, right, their land in rural areas. She has also been frequently called on to defend foreign women prisoners, especially those who have given birth while incarcerated and continue to help them find places to live or get training or jobs once they were released. She was involved finding Latin American children who were kidnapped and given to Brazilian families during the years of dictatorships. Many of these children came from Argentina or Uruguay and were only later found uh, in Brazil. Any cases involving human rights, but especially those related to those most vulnerable in society Brazilian or foreign, call out to her. So she sees more the cross than what is holy in society. Although nearly all her work is with groups or people, national and international, who do research or are formed to defend or fight for civil and human rights of the abandoned and socially excluded. Sister Anne Veronica Horner Hole. My final story is about her. She was born in Shanghai, China. <clears throat> her family fled to Brazil to find religious freedom with four of their children and later five more were born here in Brazil. Most of her time in ministry as a religious, she spent as educator and vice principal in Santa Maria and in extensive ministries in four parishes with very little priestly presence. She worked in small worship groups among the very poor. This enabled her to develop partnerships with social entities to permit access of Santa Maria students from preschool through secondary level to share experiences and to do volunteer work among those most vulnerable. Whatever existed in Santa Maria when Annie assumed a principalship in 1987, she moved it outward, inward, and beyond any traditional frontiers. My job as principal was to put these grand ideas on the agenda for the next general meeting so we could plan how to implement them all throughout the school. We kept waiting for the day everything would be done but that day never came. And now with COVID, it definitely never will arrive. Annie was an educator who had her grounding in poverty and saw education as an instrument for social justice and non-discrimination for all. She established a center for advancing pedagogical practices based on international and national models and to give courses for senior citizens. She transmitted her Holy Cross spirituality through study of the great men and women of our congregations on her own and among teachers and employees. We extended our very intentional study through visits with Brother Joel Jalenza. He came several times to the school visits to Le Mans, spiritual retreats with Holy Cross, and participation over the years in the Holy Cross Institute convocations. Now, why did I choose these and not other women? Because each of them inspire me and give a great variety of witnesses of what it means for me to be a daughter of Holy Father Moreau and witness to the Holy Cross of Jesus not as a sign of torture and death, 
but as a mark of transformation in hope that the God who is among us loves us and calls us in diverse ways to do more than we or I can ask or imagine. In summary, what these women have in common, in my view, that they took beyond the school and left within the school is love for the poor and the most vulnerable, a spirit of adventure and mission, zeal and passion to do whatever can be done to transform or at least reduce injustice and suffering. Persistence to overcome legal, financial, and even ecclesial obstacles over the years. Collaborators with anyone who will partner to take the kingdom of God forward. Faith that converses daily with God to make sure they're on the, on the same page. These are all women, and I include all our educators who don't need a study guide or a handbook for dummies to know how to live, but have the wisdom to and generosity to collaborate with others. Even Jesus chose disciples and didn't want to work alone, and he never gave up. This is the end of my presentation, but I'd like to know if you all have any comments or questions or even your own stories that you'd like to tell. And you don't even need to tell them today to me, but I think that one of the richest things that can happen in a school or as religious educators is to tell our stories and tell the stories of all those who create uh, an environment of being Jesus people within education and within society. Thank you. Sister, that was amazing. I am, I, you picked the words out like right out of my mouth. I was going to say these women are so inspiring and have done such amazing things. It just makes me want to, it literally makes me want to walk outside and work with the poor, which is just such an inspiration. Um, but I also love what you said about sharing our stories. Can you tell us any more about your journey as a sister? Like what inspired you? And I had a question written down at one point, like, did you learn Portuguese before you went to Brazil or did you just immerse? Like what, ha tell us more about your story. Cause we're so glad that you're a part of this and you've been sharing about the school and about the other sisters. Tell us more about you. Well, <clears throat> my story is a long story. I'm a natural storyteller. So everybody says, Diane, keep it short. Uh, when I was a child, my parents lived in Iran for three years. And so it was very normal for me to say, gee, I think I'll go outside the United States to work as a Sister of the Holy Cross. When I was 26 years old, Sister Joseph, Josephine Delaney that I mentioned, she came and she said, you know, Diane, if you ever think of going somewhere outside the the United States, you have to volunteer right away because it'll take three years to get chosen and to prepare. And then you'll be 30 years old and you won't be able to learn a language after you're 30. And so you have to go and volunteer right away. So I thought, oh, if it's going to take three years. So I went the next day and I said, you know, I'd like to volunteer to go to Uganda. And I said, you know, I'm not closed because I don't dare say I'm closed, but I I only want to go to Uganda. So about an hour later, the sister I went to talk to came and said, well, I talked it over with Sister Olivet. At that time, she was Mother Olivet. And she said, yes, uh, definitely you would go as soon as you can get ready and you'll go to Brazil because it's a much larger mission and you need a lot of challenge and a lot of uh, different alternatives. Since I had been a teacher, in the United States for four years. Um, so I, I was asked to work in the school and then I never left again. Uh, I, I had not studied Portuguese before I came, but as, a, as I say, when I lived in Iran, we were in a French boarding school. So I didn't really have a lot of trouble uh, learning a, a romance language. And you, people say, how long does it take? There's no how long. Uh, in a week, you have to speak, you have to speak. 
but obviously you get better as the years go on, just as you do with any other language. And if I'd ever get discouraged, I'd look at little two-year-olds and think, I'm at least as smart as that two-year-old. If, if that kid can learn to speak Portuguese, I could learn to speak Portuguese too. And I would say my intention was to stay for five years in the school and come back to the States. And I even got my master's so I could get my life degree so I could work in the States. But uh, I, I thought, you know, in five years, this will all be dull and I'll want a new challenge. It, to this day, no day is the same as the previous day. There's I, there's a challenge every day. There are new people to work with, there are new ideas, and there's so much vitality in the people I live with and the experiences and the challenges of society and the difference in them, the changes in education, what it means to be an educator. Uh, almost every single year, Annie, that I also talked about, she and I every year would, would come to the States and do education courses to try and uh, get experiences and talk to educators from throughout the world to get ideas. So um, I would say my life has been an adventure all these years since 73. And just as I said, the school never gets done. I just feel like I never get done either. And um, it's, always an, it's a, always a joy for me to share not just my story, but the story of the creation of a school that never stops. It's, it's never done. It's not like Rembrandt finishes a picture and then hangs it up on the wall. It's never ready to hang up on the wall. And uh, I would say our whole world, our whole society, unfortunately never gets done. Yet there's always so much uh, suffering and so much life that needs to be pre preserved. It's not just sustainability. It's you know, people who don't have air, people who don't have water, people who don't have place to stay. Everything is, is missing. Um, the news lets us know every day that we need to educate people who will choose to interfere with this society. And that, that's what gives me hope is knowing that I'm involved in the preparation of generations and generations of students and also of employees and people work in the school. So they also will assume the leadership of the school and the leadership of one another and new models of, um, I would say sponsorship and all of those, that newness that we have to experiment and um, that has to happen. Everything gives me great joy because I know that, that God's in charge and so he, he has the book, he knows what it is. And he says, just keep going, just keep going and listen to the people around you and you'll, you'll discover what's the next step. Just keep going. Mr. In your answer, you stole my next question. I was gonna ask what brings you hope and you answered it right there near the end. So we must be connected. <laughs> <laughs> I think I read your mind. <laughs> um, so, Tell me about what, um, can, you, can you share with us anything about your prayer life or about your devotions that has uh, helped you, you know, keep that connection to our Lord throughout your mission and or um, remain, keeping that hope alive? Any prayers you can recommend to us or anything along your prayer life that would be helpful? No. Um, let me just say, I think that that which most nourishes prayer life are the people I live with and minister with who also share prayer with me and daily prayer moments with me. Uh, that's always been, uh, I would say, a source of nourishment. And it's continuous over the time. But I would say it's always based on reading and rereading the scriptures, uh, whether it's uh, scripture scholars or just reflections um, that we do with one another and try and see how uh, what is going on in the life of Jesus and the people who lived among him. What, what is Jesus? What are all those people uh, trying to discover? And they're, they're constantly lost and constantly asking questions. So I think 
one of the most interesting things I found is when you read scripture, just pay attention to the questions and try and answer the questions that people ask. Jesus asked some of them, the people who walk with him. People are asking questions all the time. Even David was asking questions. So try and answer the questions. And uh, I think there's light in, in finding some of those answers. Thank you. I like the Our Father. I mean, you know, I like the Our Father, the Hail Mary. I like the Memorare. I like the Salve Regina, but I don't know whether I can recommend those to other people. Well, but I think what you said speaks so true to like why we're doing the convocation year after year, this idea of community and this connection with one of us, like we grow with one another. And I think that that's, you know, that's, it's great to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And I love how we can connect to inspire each other in that way. Yes. And I really ha loved having you as a partner too. Thanks. Because you're also working at a partner school in the States. We it's our one school in the States. And for us in Latin America, Santa Maria is our one school in Latin America that the sisters have. So, yep, we're sisters in the, in the battle. Here we are. <laughs> well, sister, anything else you wanna share with us before we uh, wrap it up? I don't think so, because I've shared a lot. <laughs> But it was all amazing and interesting and inspiring is the word that I would use. So thank you for giving this presentation and uh, sharing all of your gifts and all of uh, all of your time, your ministry. We're just so blessed to have you as a part of this congregation and as a part of the Holy Cross family. Okay, well, thank you. And thank all the people who are gonna watch this, if not today, as the months come go by. So I hope that it, other people can also start looking around and listening to stories of other people they work and live with. So thank you.